Well, I'm very pleased that for tonight I get to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ronald Williamson, uh, the founder of Archaeological Services, Inc., Toronto, Ontario, although he is now uh, retired, and I think he's called the Senior Associate at Archaeological Services, Inc. Uh, Dr. Williamson received his BA from the University of Western Ontario, that fine institution, uh, in 1977, and then went on to do his MA in 1980 and PhD in 1985 in anthropology at McGill University in Montreal, uh, where he was supervised by the most distinguished archaeologist, the late Dr. Bruce Trigger. Uh, for his whole career, Ron has been involved in CRM archaeology. I think ASI started in 1980 uh, and really was one of the founders of that practice uh, in Ontario. He has participated in and run innumerable major CRM projects and importantly, uh, has re this has resulted and continues to result in, I like to say, a plethora of significant academic and technical publications. I do not know what the exact total is up to, but he has published or edited at least 17 books that I know about uh, with major publishers like Altamira Press, McGill Queens, and the Canadian Museum of Civilization. And he's also written over 70 research articles in major journals like American Antiquity, the Journal of Archaeological Science, the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, and so on, as well as in volumes published by major publishers such as Cambridge University Press, Routledge, Oxford University Press, University of Utah, University of Colorado Press, and so on. Uh, however, as all good local archaeologists here should do, he has also published in the Canadian Journal of Archaeology, Ontario Archaeology, the OAS's Arch Notes, and of course the most important, Kiwa, the newsletter of the London chapter of the Ontario Archaeological Society. These have covered the whole gamut of pre-European time from the earliest paleo occupations to his particular specialty in the late woodland, but he's also done much work on later European sites as on his books on the history and archaeology of Upper Canada's first parliament buildings uh, and Snake Hill, an investigation of a military cemetery from the War of 1812. I greatly admire him for his work, as not all CRM-based archaeologists obviously published a lot of their research, which is unfortunate. Uh, Ron has also done much to make archaeology, uh, archaeological insights available to more of the general public and publicize that. Uh, he's appeared in numerous films or advised in numerous documentary films on and videos on archaeology uh, for PBS, TVO, and a number of others. Uh, one I remember is the one on Camp X in Oshawa, which I wish they'd interviewed me for that one because I grew up like a mile from the place. And as a kid, I used to crawl all over there finding artifacts like bullet casings, rubber life raft remnants and K-ration boxes unopened. <laughs> I don't know how long they'd been there. I wasn't going to open to find out. Uh, he's Anyway, he's done a lot of popular publications as well. Many of his academic works, he's also published a mere uh, uh, books that, that are the popular aspects of them. He's also supported many archaeological institutions, including Longwoods Conservation Area, Scanado, where we hold our uh, uh, picnics and, and everything every year. Uh, and he actually excavated some small Iroquois villages there in 1980, early 1980s. And of course, he's also service, has served for the Museum of Ontario Archaeology for many years as, as president of the board of directors. Now, he's received many awards for his research, uh, including the Peggy Armstrong Provincial Public Archaeology Award from the Ontario Archaeological Society in 1998 a Heritage Toronto Award of Merit in 2009, the OAS Award of Excellence in CRM in 12, 2012, the OAS Award of Excellence in Publishing in 2013, the smith Wintenberg Award from the Canadian Archaeological Association in 2016, and most recently in, in 2023, he was a recipient of a Lieutenant Governor's Ontario uh, Heritage Award for his commitment to Ontario Conservation Heritage. Uh, for his talk tonight, he's going to tell us about one of his most recent books and give us actually an update on the book since it's been published uh, on that, The Archaeology of the Iroquois de Nord, which I have just learned has been shortlisted for a history award from the uh, Indie Award from the independent publishers in the U.S. So without further ado, I turn it over to Ron. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, not, not sure where you got all that, but thanks very much. Most of it's true. The uh, <laughs> I sure wish that we had had... Uh, access to those artifacts when we did that uh, Camp X uh, film, because we, I, I'm not sure we we hardly found a thing when, when we did that. Um, but, you know, as it goes, you have to make the, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the publisher of this book is in the audience tonight, Pierre de Rosier from the National Museum of History. Um, my intention really is is to talk a bit about the book for any of any of the audience that hasn't 
seen the book yet or know what it's about, but at the same time, just review a little bit about what's happened since the book was published last spring about the various subjects that the, that the chapters cover. Um, we were very fortunate to have Rick Hill as a participant in, in this book and in planning it and in, um, and in writing it. And I think it was because of the last two points in his quote on this slide. Uh, what happened to the people who used to live here? We don't know a lot about that, and that's why we actually did this book. Here's, here's the book, and I must say right off the bat that it was Rob Von Bitter that began this research 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, assembled a small group of people to begin to look at this question, uh, or these questions, and um, Rob invited me into it kind of late in the process, about 2018, and I started kind of getting very intrigued by what he and his team were doing. Uh, I'll show you a few slides in a minute about their work using LIDAR to locate some of these sites. But Rob uh, was a driving force in getting this going, and so I joined him in, in editing this book and, and putting it together. Um, Thanks, Chris, for noting the Indies finalist. Uh, the publishers are proud of this, and we're proud of this. Um, I, as as these things happen, the, the publisher submits them, so it came as a real surprise to us that uh, that this had happened, and we're delighted. Um, I really want to acknowledge the very various participants in this volume and the ways in which this volume turned out so beautifully. Um, first of all, the publishers at the University of Ottawa Press and of course Pierre and others at the museum were an absolute delight to work with. It was a wonderful experience. And Pierre sold it to me just after an OAS conference in 2019. In the fall of 2019, we did a, a session on this and Pierre came up to me kind of late uh, after the uh, after the session and and asked about w whether we were thinking of publishing and would we consider uh, the, the Mercury series and my response was sure if we can still uh, publish in color and Pierre was quick to point out that yes everything could be in color the the, the graphs and the photographs which just makes the book pop. But it wouldn't pop without the expertise of a number of, of people who you see along the top here, uh, who were exceptionally important. Uh, John Howarth, who took, uh, uh, who took photographs that had been done by Marty Cooper, myself, Dilf Box especially, uh, in the mid 2000s and early 2000s and took those photographs and turned them into what you see in the volume. Andrew Stewart, who, who worked on the maps and Chris Mennery, who worked on the maps. And I take the time to say this because without a whole lot of technical work, the volume would not have the quality that it does. The other thing that happened in this is Rick prepared a land acknowledgement uh, for those of you who don't know, Rick is a senior Haudenosaunee scholar, uh, well-respected, a uh, former curator at the Smithsonian, uh, has held lots of positions and is very active in interpreting in, uh, Haudenosaunee culture uh, in the Northeast. He wrote this in an effort to escape a little bit in certain places of the overlapping traditional territories and treaty territories of peoples. And he wanted to have the focus on stewardship of Mother Earth. And so Rick wrote this and we adopted this as the land acknowledgement for the volume. I should point out that there is a more traditional land acknowledgement as well that, that the museum uh, has in their volumes. So both are there. Uh, just quickly, what's in the book? Uh, I prepared an introduction to the book, which I'll say a few words about in a minute. And then Kurt Jordan, the eminent uh, historian and, and archaeologist at Cornell, 
wrote uh, a piece about the context of Haudenosaunee life at the time of the Iroquois du Nord villages. Um, and then Rob and his team uh, prepared two chapters. One was the search for Kente, and the other was the search for Ganaraske, Kentuo, and Ganeas. And uh, you will see in a few minutes what was involved in doing that work. Uh, the Bead Hill site, our own Dana, Dana Fulton wrote that based on his work on, on Bead Hill. It's actually Ganastiagon. And then we have Tiagon uh, on the West Branch uh, of the Toronto Carrying Place, which is the Humber River, Bobby Point in Toronto. And then Neil wrote a chapter, an intriguing chapter on um, who was at the uh, historic village of Tianawata, which is uh, west of Burlington somewhere. Um, there was then a um, wonderful chapter done by Bill Fox, David Harris in April on uh, the glass beads, bone beads and stone beads of the Iroquois du Nord. Uh, David Harris is in the audience tonight as well. So if there's a tough question, I'll throw it at him. Um, Come from the Shadows, Chapter 9, Metals, that's Martin Cooper. He's looked at these things for a long time, and he also looked at uh, a site called the Van Son uh, Cemetery, which Marion White looked at. Martin had another look at that, and he's wondering if that is not an Iroquois and Nord site as well. And then Rob Von Bitter and I looked at the antler cones, and then the vessels and pipes were looked, by, looked at by Bill Engelbrecht and myself as well. We then turn the chapter, if you like, or turn the, uh, have a new division of um, looking at the Anishinaabe occupation of these Iroquois villages once they um, were abandoned roughly around 1688. And finally, there are two concluding chapters, one by Victor Conrad, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, and then uh, the volume closes with the thoughts uh, by Rick Hill and his uh, discussion of what he thought was important about the book. Um, so here's one of the maps that was published that shows the sites. Okay, so we have Tagon here, you know, Wata's over here, Ganastigon, and then we have Kente, which is on this map right in here, right there. And we have Ganaraske, Kentio here, and we should have um, I don't quite see it yet. Anyways, I don't see Ganaeus, but it's there. And then um, we have a series of those maps. The first person who did comprehensive work on the IDN was Victor Conrad. And so any of us who have looked at this subject knows that a there was a very influential and, and uh, important article written by Conrad, Victor Conrad, in 1981 who looked at the documentary record and what he thought he knew about where the sites were. Um, so in his chapter towards the end of the volume, he noted um, his opinion that a kind of more balanced and detailed explanation of the idea and story lay in a, in a very um, uh, effective, use of cross-disciplinary work and synthesis. And um, he pointed out that we all did our best to, to do that in the various chapters that, that are in the book. But he also noted that indigenous memory plays an important role in, in this. And that's reflected in uh, Rick's contribution, but it's reflected also in many of our, um, our chapters where we discuss, for example, um, uh, Hill's interpretation of the cones um, and um, the, the important work uh, that's been done with archaeologists and uh, Indigenous people in, in reviewing material culture. Um, the last chapter that Gary Wark and I wrote about the Anishinaabeg occupation, um, the, the history of of the use of those sites by Anishinaabe peoples is relies entirely on uh, oral history and and, uh, and memory. So this was also an important element in this book. Uh, so the introduction lays out uh, really the context in which we end up 
with Iroquois villages established in the early 1660s along the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And uh, I wanted to take that back 150 years to when the Iroquois uh, conflict, the traditional enmity between uh, mainly the Huron Wendat and the uh, Haudenosaunee, and also Huron Wendat allies, some other um, Algonquian uh, neighbors like the Nipissing and the Ottawa Valley Algonquians. And <clears throat> so uh, this chapter covers the fact that um, through a series of, um, of or, or a number of avenues of archaeological research, one of which is human trophies or trophies made of human bone and and scattered human bone. We looked at 60 Ontario Iroquois sites. We updated the work that I had done in 2007 and that Tara Jenkins had done for a master's thesis and published in an in excellent article. Um, and just updated that again. And you can see here using uh, Birch and Manning's new dates for sites that the, uh, the height of this material appearing on archaeological sites is between 1500 and 1550, um, which co corresponds, of course, with the appearance of Europeans. Um, by 1600, uh, that bone drops off at least between, let's say, 1580 and, and the end of GPP-1 sites. And you don't see that amount of human bone. There's very little at ball sites, for example, there's very little at the mantle site even, um, but it picks up dramatically at the Scandatut site. We now have Watts there, and that's a site that was probably occupied until about 1610 when it when those people left and joined the Confederacy. So um, one of the things that we looked at in some detail was uh, in a characterization of the Iroquois Wars, um, while it started in the early part of the 16th century, there was a bit of a lull. It picked up again, of course, um, with European presence in the in Eastern Canada, direct presence. And then we get um, a really powerful pickup in the kind of um, battles and conflict that's happening between 1630 and 1669. And these are, so the, the 25 is the number of hostile encounters between Haudenosaunee and Wendat happening in Wendaki. And so you can look at the number of encounters that are happening also along the St. Lawrence River. Um, and you see also these circles spreading out from the Haudenosaunee homeland. And the Haudenosaunee are, are moving a field to ensure that they control the entire territory. And in fact, um, that got me thinking a lot about the change in conflict and the uh, reasons for that conflict. And if there was any way of um, kind of modeling that as well. And um, I came across an article by Lindsay Montgomery, who now teaches at the University of Toronto, and her analysis of the expansion of Comanche territory uh, in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And in that, she makes the point that you don't have to be a state level society um, to uh, have imperialist tendencies. And she makes uh, very clear the point that um, if, if, uh, if you have large political units, and she breaks it, expansionist or with a memory of power extended over space, polities that maintain distinction and hierarchy as they incorporate new people. And that the key characteristics, characteristics of those polities are people with a collective identity, shared political structure, and the capacity to mobilize resources. Well, I was reading that and thinking this fits uh, the Northern Iroquois pattern quite well, and it especially fits the, um, the Haudenosaunee pattern from the mid, uh, mid 17th century onward. And so uh, I wrote a paper with Jen Birch about this for last year's uh, SAAs and um, argued about the parallels that we see in the kind of formulation of Comanche imperialism and what the Haudenosaunee were doing. 
I want to point out that this these last few slides are under what's new. This is not in the volume, but it's it generated these uh, thoughts and uh, this research because of the focus we put on establishing the context of setting up these villages in the 1660s along the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And so that was a perfect lead into Kurt Jordan in chapter two to talk about um, the Haudenosaunee presence on the North Shore um, and how he saw um, the decisions to establish those uh, resulting from confidence on the part of, of people, um, very various influences that were affecting these uh, decisions. Um, you can see here the, the dynamics of fission and fusion in these villages. And he links that to territorial expansion in, in a number of ways. So it's a very interesting chapter um, and really talking about the peak power of the Haudenosaunee in the last half of the century. Um, and he provides maps um, which, which show sites and towns that he thinks Greenlaw um, encountered in 1677 and then also where towns moved um, after the French invasions and where they were at almost the turn of the 17th century or turn of the 18th century, I should say. Um, but all in all, one of the major constraints to our ability to talk about the IDN is simply not knowing where they were. Um, so one objective of the book was, was in a major section to review all of the historic information that was out there uh, and any archaeological information and see if we could figure out where sites were. Well, for Tagon and Ganassigan, it wasn't that difficult. We already knew that Bobby Point, the rather tony neighborhood in Toronto on the Humber, was the site of Tagon. I can I can show you a couple of slides later why. And and Dana, um, who who did a lot of work in Bead Hill over the years, uh, demonstrated that it is uh, Ganassigan. Uh, in Neil's paper, we're very clear that we don't actually know where Tinawata is. Now, just so you can have a close look at these sites, I mean, you can compare these maps. If we look at Ganaspigan, we have it on the right side of the portage or on the right side of the ridge. It's actually on the left side. Tiagon's on the right side there, on the correct side, I should say. We have Ganaraske, Kente, and uh, you have Kensio here, but you can't really see where it is. And so these maps provide us with the general location of these places uh, and not much to go on. There is some uh, ethnography about it, some oral history and some documentary history. Um, and so Rob wanted to start with the village of Kente, the principally Cayuga village of Kente on the North Shore, which, which he saw as a hub um, from which people would go out to smaller communities. Um, it turns out probably the Ganeas to the east was likely uh, an Oneida uh, settlement. Uh, the, uh, because uh, the Cayuga were, were directing traffic from Kente, it seemed pretty clear that was a major reason why uh, it was selected for the site of the Sulpician mission as well. Um, so you see on the right, the document um, written to depict the first, first family moving to Kente um, from the Oneida. So they would have gone on to Ganeas. And um, we see that one was in Erie and one and her husband was a Wendat. And so we were reminded of the cosmopolitan nature of the Haudenosaunee through all their adoptions, through warfare, but also how people um, were returning in some time, sometimes to former homelands. And that's certainly the major factor in Neil's chapter about Tina Wanta. Oh, I wanted to make another point about this one at the follow, uh, at, the, at the end, which is that the smaller outposts and understanding the relationship between the larger villages and the smaller outposts became a very important theme for us throughout the volume. 
uh, in our research. So um, Rob and, and uh, Chris and uh, Nick Romhoff uh, did a chapter looking at um, modern maps of Prince Edward County and the historical maps, especially the Joliet map, in order to try and figure out uh, if you could, if they could identify what was being looked at. And so they, by orienting the maps somewhat differently, um, they felt that this area here was at the mouth of the Carrying Place Portage that, that went into the bay, and that C and D here were, were actually um, uh, bald head here across from Smokes Point, which was which was where ultimately we think the village um, and, and the mission site was. Um, one of the reasons we think about that is because of this man, G.J. Chad, who did a lot of collecting. Um, and in 1921, this collection came to the Royal Ontario Museum, described at the time by Orr as the finest private archeological collection in Canada. Chad and all his work was brought to our attention in large ways by David Harris, who's on the call tonight. Uh, he published a, a profile of Chad in Ontario Archaeology, but, but David's work with, with Chad and our uh, close examination of Chad's collection as described in various AAROs was exceptionally important uh, to us. And the material uh, in the Chad collection from Baldhead Island it was clear that there was a cemetery on the island and that it related to Kente as evidenced by the mid to late 17th century artifacts. So this was really an important advance uh, to understand who Chad was and to understand um, where the collections in uh, the museum that Orr had described uh, were, and they were all examined as part of this process. So a possible location of Ganaraske, we'll go to that a little bit more, but these are the places that were being collected by Chad, and we're right in the area where we believe Kente is, uh, Smokes Point and Bald Head being right there. So we even did a little bit of a, and when I say we, I'm talking about Rob Von Vetter and Chris and Nick, uh, did a statistical analysis of where most of the material in that collection came from. And uh, so you'll see here, well over a thousand glass beads coming from Bald Head here, and uh, 400 glass beads coming from Smokes Point, um, where with the owner, I think, I think we can figure out where the mission uh, was and where the village was. But also we, we, we see how the Caring Place Trail from you know, Wellers Bay, Lake Ontario, and into the Bay of Quinte, how that portage was so important because all of all the material that has been found there and on Indian Island, so Indian Island is right here. So this is all very important information that led us, first of, first of all, away or led them away from Squire's site, which there is a plaque here that says that um, the Kente mission was there. As you can see, here's a, a note to the Kente mission and um, their chapter uh, sheds all sorts of doubt about the Squire site. And I'll let you read it for yourself. Um, I won't cover that too much here, but um, what I can say is that any reference to Kente at the Squire site at Consecon, Lake Consecon has now been removed from the official Ontario Archaeological Site record. And once we can get more concrete evidence here at Smokes Point, this, this will be likely the new place. Now, Porta uh, <clears throat> modeling the routes uh, by which people got to the other outposts uh, was um, kind of an exciting adventure for these guys. They did it using LIDAR. Chris Menner is an expert with that technology. And he began to look at the various routes uh, that one could take in the various places where you would have a likely village location. So um, using LIDAR, and for those of you who don't know LIDAR, light detection and ranging remote sensing, um, it 
it, he, he, through a careful analysis, uh, concluded that Ganaeus is likely within that dotted line and that that's probably the portage route that was uh, kind of the path of least resistance to get from uh, the Napanee River into Hay Bay. So um, here's where we're talking about, that's the portage and Indian, Indian Island I was showing you on the other map is just about here. Um, and then modeling for where Kintio could be. And they came up with three options. One would be that it, it could be here linked to what's known as the Percy Portage it, that people could have got here and into another site called Canoint. I don't know how to say that exactly. Oops. Um, and then uh, one at the mouth of the Otonabe here. And then another option here at the south end of Rice Lake that connects to where Ganarask is marked on most of the maps. It's the one site um, that seems pretty clear that it was on the east side of the Ganarask in this lower stretch, but a little bit up from, from, the, from the lake. So this was modeled in, in more detail. And in fact, um, so they looked at moving through this terrain and then coming into here and where the best locations for these villages would be, assuming uh, sites that would match something along the line of Taigan or Ganastion, although they wouldn't be that large. And they chose uh, the two best locations as being here. So um, this has not yet been um, field tested. And that's something that uh, Chris and Rob, Vid Rob Von Vitter are, are planning on, uh, on doing. But as you can see, we're far um, closer to having places to look for this as a result of the analyses that these guys did. Uh, Dana, as I pointed out, has been working on Ganastigan for years. It's part of the Rouge National Urban Park Study Area. Um, and the material culture that's come off that site, as you will see in some of the slides following, is absolutely clearly um, late 17th century Haudenosaunee. Um, in Dana's chapter, he talks about the various visitations by English, Dutch, and French traders and missionaries, and the activities that went on there as a result of the archaeological, well, as a result of the documentary evidence, but also the archaeological work, suggesting a population of, of perhaps 800 or more people. David Robertson uh, from ASI, one of the partners at ASI, um, uh, did the chapter on Tagon, um, established, um, constructed probably after uh, or around the time of Fort Frontenac in the, in the 1670s, um, and thought to be even more diverse uh, a town than Ganatsa Um And the recent excavations at Bobby Point have revealed a number, uh, was recently two very clear Seneca um, female burials. Um, but there's lots of other evidence of it uh, because of work that was done developing um, a garden, uh, or garden survey, a, a very unique kind of development that that um, was footprint disturbance only, and so one of the burials, for example, was found in this upper left um, image. Uh, another burial yielded this pot and this comb, which um, now has been examined in a lot of detail by a number of people. Um, and now what's happening, and this is new since the book, is uh, the, 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 the delineation and definition of a heritage conservation district for uh, TAGON. So you, with an HCD, it's a planning tool that allows planners to manage change and um, enhance the heritage values uh, of the area. 
as it goes, and it gives it far better protection under the Heritage Act. Um, obviously, there's protection afforded by the Section 48.1 of the Heritage Act, but as we all know, the more tools in our basket to protect sites, the better. And um, we're right now in the middle of um, information sessions and consultation sessions around how this can be done, um, both with the population at, that live in this neighborhood and with Indigenous uh, folks, especially Six Nations who, who and HDI, who, who's uh, directly related to these folks. Um, we would do this HD, HCD because of the importance of, of Tiagon, obviously, um, but also because it's one of the earliest garden suburbs of Toronto. Um, um, and you can see here, um, Robert Holmes Smith, uh, it's one of his early designs, the bottom right kind of giving you an idea of what it might look like. And so the Humber Valley survey was, was um, there, were, there were a number of, of places where the, these uh, very early subdivisions were being built and they're largely intact from the time they were constructed. So what does that mean in terms of protection? Well, just take a look at what development and alter alteration type can be monitored. Um, so obviously additions to structures, meaning if you're going to add an, if you're going to provide an addition to a house, you get looked at. Um, Subsurface disturbances on the property, foundation repairs, service hookups, especially service hookups, because they're crossing the undisturbed areas of the properties. And that's how the burials that have been found recently were found. Um, hundreds of burials were found when this subdivision was built uh, and documented. Um, but, uh, and by the way, we're not sure where those remains are. They are not at Rom. Landscape alterations, um, which might require grade changes, they're included. So all of this work is, uh, and proposed work is subject now to archeological assessment in advance. And these colored areas are all areas that have been assessed as part of that. So numerous archeological companies have been working on this. Yields chapter, um, is uh, is covered in in his chapter seven. Uh, it uh, discusses uh, Galanay's route in 1669, which avoids the, the Niagara area because of fear of Vandaste, who might be raiding in this area. And so, uh, when they were at a Seneca village, they were diverted. Um, from with a guide from Burlington Bay and then into um, this general area. And then there was a portage made over to the Grand River and Galinay carried on with, with his group. Neil is very um, adamant that this is not a Seneca nor, nor the Iroquois village, but um, Iroquois to North village, but a um, a settlement that was occupied by probably people who had been neutral were adopted by Haudenosaunee and were taking and who, who were visiting well-known hunting grounds, but as it turned out, was also on travel routes so that um, the Europeans discovered that, that this site was here and that they traveled down the Grand after a short portage. Um, it's funny, uh, Neil recalls um, or tells a tale of, of a collector bringing material into Ma McMaster University when he was there doing his PhD. And he took a quick look at it and thought to himself, yeah, this, this material is much later than, than we usually see. This is, probably, um, this is probably late 17th century. But in fact, um, he did not take detailed notes at the time. And so He's not sure exactly where that where, where that collection is today. Part of um, part of the new team that's looking for that, led by Bill Fox, uh, he's putting a team together to look at that. 
they're examining all of the maps, some of which uh, are in the book. Well, most of these are in the book. And they're blowing up the sections that deal with the, um, the um, portage over to the Grand, but also uh, from the Bay, more detailed ones. And Bill's going to lead a team looking at those sites. There was a time when some of the uh, mid-century neutral sites, historic neutral sites, because of what they were yielding, were they were thought as possible candidates to to be in Wanta, but they are not. They are uh, late historic neutral sites. So look for more information coming out about this site. Uh, really, I think it's fair to say this this research was spawned by by the book and by Neil's chapter. Um, and then there's a series of chapters about the material culture of of the um, of these sites and what the relationship between the material culture found on these sites versus the homeland. Uh, what are what are those relationships? And uh, Bill and David Harris and April did uh, the or did the work in the first chapter um, in the material culture section of the volume. Um, so the, the following slides are actually from, from their chapter. Most of these were taken by Bill, and but they were enhanced by John, uh, John Howard. So they're, they're wonderful shot. They're wonderful shots, and I think uh, contribute to the, to the quality of the volume. So um, one of the points um, made by the team is that, the glass beads made by a contemporaneous village um, uh, called Dan, the, the, the diversity of color and form uh, following the mid-century is reflected in the Willers Bay localities. As you can see in the right, the same color, same kind of colors that are occurring here are occurring on these strings uh, in this area. So that was one of the, one of the observations they made. Um, yet, um, those pea-sized round red and black beads, which are so important uh, in, um, in dating sites, um, and they constitute 72 to 85 percent um, of the recoveries from Gnastiagon and Tiagon. Um, and with the exception of the Hilton site on Smokes Point, none of the assemblages from the eastern sites produce more than about 40% of these types. So we, we know there's something going on here. And these beads played a very important role at Tagon in the analysis of beads that led um, uh, to uh, some conclusions about the sawn occupation, so you may watch occupation on a site that Jackie Fisher excavated in Southampton a number of years ago in a, in a trial. So these bead analyses have far-reaching uh, implications in terms of the material culture um, trends and how that relates to indigenous history and land claims. Um, bone beads in the collections, here's one in particular. Um, and uh, they make the point that there are, I guess, 31 round, three oval, and two tubular in the collection. Um, one that looks very much like one on a rosary uh, crucifix at St. Marie one. Um, and Bill makes the point that I think the ones from the Chad collection are very consistent with the late 17th century Lassanen um, beads. Um, mixing of beads by collectors is probably happening in a number of cases. You see a large star faceted bead here um, a faceted star bead along with a, a stone um, a bead and lots of shell bead, a discoidal shell bead, um, and um, could re relate to Chad stringing these beads together. Um, no paddlinite beads have been found on the eastern Cayuga sites, although two are two were found at uh, Ganesta Wagon and nine at Tagon, and that becomes important uh, in some work that Bill's doing now. And you can see some catlinite here and also um, some siltstone uh, beads. And Bill is focusing, uh, those of you who know, are, is focusing on this research right now 
on the distribution of these red siltstone, but also uh, catlinite beads. And in fact, uh, his, his new article on catlinite beads, which I think was published last month in the Journal of, of the Society of Bead Researchers, uh, looks at the historical distribution of catlinite as opposed to siltstone beads. And I think, uh, I think that, that our volume, the IDN volume, led Bill to want to look into this far, in far more detail. So knowing Bill, as you will, some of you do, that led to him wanting to do the, the historical research and the uh, collections research, and now comes a new, a new contribution, which is very important. Um, so you've got to understand what's happening here is red siltstone being available and probably produced by Adawa, and then uh, getting a, these this what's the difference in the distribution between that and the exotic catlinite, which is coming from the Midwest, as you see over here. Um, but building on the work, of course, of um, the major work of New York researchers and um, who, who were working at the material from a number of these sites, um, we see Simpowski noting the increasing number of marine chalice and pendants in the second half of the century, as well as these moon effigy pendants, um, which certainly post date 1650. And um, they're, they're great time makers, and they are present in the Chad collection from Picton and Bloomfield, which is um, which is uh, relatively close to the area that we're talking about, and relatively close to the Kente site. Um, and again, we have a um, belt, wampum belt, um, from Ganatsa Wagon found found on the site, which again helps us know that Bead Hill is is that site. At Tagon, uh, we have some lovely uh, purple and white wampum beads that survived. Um, I'll just give you an idea of their former beauty. But again, the photography enhanced uh, our view of these objects. Many metal objects off the sites. Um, um, we have the brass, small brass pots, the projectile points, the axe, uh, iron knife handle, some armament, French flints, and um, some lovely uh, so-called Jesuit rings off these sites, although Marty makes the point that uh, when the sail ship LaBelle went down, there were uh, thousands of, of these that were intended for the quote-unquote market. So they may not have had much to do with Jesuits. And then he reviews the various forms that were found. And I won't go over all these, but I'll just point out that the bottom one is uh, a very um, distinct, distinctive one and, and not seen um, much. Found on Ganondekai. And uh, some of you will know that site as Bowton Hill. And we can surmise that these also were found not only on fingers, but in multiples on necklaces uh, and so on onto clothing. So these aren't just finger rings, and it's important to know that. So you can see here, uh, this is all outlined in this chapter. So um, he, re he reviews that as well as medallions. Um, and what we can tell from the medallions, they're not as useful in terms of chronological markers. Um, so the one on the bottom, the heart-shaped one, we can only say for certain um, that the five saints that are uh, canonized uh, in 1622 appear on this medal. Um, so it, we, we, the only thing we can say is this medallion post-date 1622, we can't link it directly to an idea in sight, even though it was found on one. Um, well, obviously it was still around. Um, and then crosses and crucifixes do appear on contemporary sites, but are absent on, on sites on the North Shore. Um, <clears throat> brass projectile points. I don't think the volume had anything to do with um, um, encouraging uh, Craig Chapola from Rome to study the brass projectile points that were in the Chad collection, but we were very surprised to see this happen. Um, he looked at the Caring Place and the um, Marie Township collections, the Indian Island collections, 
and compared it to um, Bobby Point and you know, the Tagon. Um, interestingly, not kind of referring to the IDN period in quite the way that we did. So, uh, but a very detailed analysis of these, and basically a morphological study of these brass projectile points. And Marty, kind of in reviewing that article, asked the question, um, could the plasticity and variable weight of sheet copper, uh, could the weight be um, a more important variable than shape and morphology? Interesting question. And uh, noted that the weights vary quite a lot. Uh, with different kinds of uh, alloy bra uh, brasses. So um, lots of work to do there. Um, when people make contributions, it usually stimulates more research, and that's what's important here. So I just wanted to bring to your attention that there is a very detailed study of, of projectile points done by, by Craig before he left Rome. The combs. Um, are analyzed in a chapter by myself and, and Rob von Bitter, where we're looking at um, the designs, the etched designs on these combs. Um, that uh, is based on the research of Charles Ray from uh, 60 years ago. Um, he looked at combs from Fountain Hill and other places and uh, described them in a very influential article. And um, but also looking at other researchers who have looked at this material. For any of you who work with uh, indigenous worldview and the reflections of that worldview in material culture, you without doubt have read George Hamill's various materials that is a very important and influential guy who's written about this material. And none of, no Canadians that I know that are writing about this haven't talked to I haven't talked to George about this. Um, and he uh, and Rick Hill have both talked about the hourglass form that shows up in both the spaces uh, created by the various ways um, these objects are, are designed. So this, this black area here is simply a, a kind of showing you the various hourglass forms that show up in in these. Um, and you get it from some very unusual, you get that R, R shape by, by positioning the legs in very unusual ways, so like, like this one. Uh, but there are, there are also um, hawker form pipes, which um, Hamill uh, and, and Bean thought related to the keepers of the Western door. And um, the uh, image of a hawker shows up on a pipe as well um, from the Kente region. Actually, I think it's from Wellington area. Um, yeah, Wellington. Um, and then um, the Wolf Clan uh, doorkeeper pipe uh, here. Well, at Tagon, um, we have a piece here that that was found on the site. Um, we're thinking it likely comes from a comb in this fashion, although the ends were rounded. Um, and maybe it's similar to the one that, that Hamill and Dean um, looked at from Kirkwood. Uh, they argued that the Wolf Clan were the last Seneca chiefs to agree to join the Confederacy and uh, thus appointed the Western doorkeeper. So our ability to relate some of the objects we find on these sites to this kind of material relies a lot on the work that's been done previously with some of these New York sites. This comb has been looked at by many. Um, it's a gorgeous comb uh, found in one of the burials. Um, it was obviously reburied with um, the woman um, by Haudenosaunee chief and faith keeper. And um, there were a couple of resin replicas made by Ron uh, with the permission of the chief. And um, you can see here uh, on the panther, who we believe is Miji Pishu, you see the rattlesnake tail. You have this kind of figure, human figure on the back. This probably had another bear or whatever it was uh, that would have been 
symmetrical because most of most of these combs were symmetrical, but you get all sorts of interesting imagery, including power lines emerging from a sun here, a sun figure here, which is fascinating uh, in the sense that these power lines um, figure prominently in northern rock art, and they figure prominently in Norval Morso's art of the sixteen of the nineteen fifties when he first started. So these are this is iconography that has a very long history and is used today. Um, I wanted to put um, Rick Hill's interpretation of this poem up um, because it it's it's. It's very important. Um, what I like about his interpretation most is his relation to the creation story, but also how he believes it's important to consider how this is uh, looked at by the observer and that there may not be one meaning to these cones. There could be multiple meanings. And as he says here, um, a human is in the moment of transformation from the panther, uh, and he doesn't look at it as a life taker, but as one who um, is giving life. And he, uh, in his speculation on meaning, it's what he needed to draw from, from this comb at that time, a lesson for all of us um, to, to abandon notions that these objects have one meaning. Um, there was another Teagon comb uh, with obviously referencing European, European figures, um, wide brim hats on the outside figures, um, have a similar kind of comb from Ganetza Lagon, um, the small dots, probably buttons, but facial features, used for facial features. So uh, the design is very similar to combs uh, on the on the south shore of Lake Lake Ontario as well in the homeland. A fabulous um, thesis written by a woman named Bergseth that if people are into this, um, you should check out this chapter and read uh, and and get the reference and you can read the you can read the most of the combs by the way are illustrations by Savannah Paradis Blue. Um, this is a, a comb that was um, in the AARO, as you can see, and I want you to pay attention to this one and this one. Um, so um, we have these from Homeland sites, and this one is from a Homeland site, but it is almost identical to the Smokes Point comb that was found in another consultant's report that we didn't reproduce. Um, and then this one, led to all sorts of speculations and illustration of that comb based on photography and the image in, in the ARO. And note the stars, um, this terrier, which uh, uh, led to some speculation in the article about that. Um, it's obviously a European, but with the star. And um, that's imagery that Ray identified in many combs uh, in various um, homes from the homeland. And it shows up in the, uh, that same kind of figure shows up in the, uh, the Tiagon comb. And um, one of the points that uh, Jim Bradley made, which I latched onto quickly, was that uh, you don't, you know, we don't need to, to, to go far to think about um, the explanation and the origin of of these images, they appear in nature. And um, as, as Jim says, the use of rays to depict spiritual power was intuitive. Um, Bill Ankelbrecht and I looked at uh, the ceramics and the pipe, meaning both vessels and pipes, and looked at um, both Huron, uh, Wendat style, pipe, uh, style ceramics and Shoni style ceramics and looked at their distribution and the vessel and the, uh, the chapter covers that. Um, there are some wonderful effigy pipes that show up on some of these sites um, and look like the same kind of pipes coming from the homeland area. But 
some of them are also pipes that um, you could easily uh, find, like this one from Tagon, you could easily find on earlier sites as well. And then the last um, kind of chapter deals with, or before the two concluding chapters, deals with the um, movement of Anishinaabeg people off the North Shore of Georgia Bay, Lake Huron, and into um, uh, the North Shore area of Lake Ontario into Southern Ontario and throughout Southern Ontario. And I want to point out that this history is drawn from Anishinaabe scholars, uh, Podash in particular. His history, um, as you can see here, includes a very detailed uh, chronicle of the migration from the North Shore of Lake Huron military encounters with the Haudenosaunee that led to their occupation of Southern Ontario. Um, and there is kind of a rich literature developing about the role of Anishinaabe people in pushing the Haudenosaunee in the 1680s out of Southern Ontario. Because of Den Denonville's attacks, the draw by those attacks back to the homeland to help defend the homeland and was it a mix of these two things? And there's a bit of discussion about that in this chapter. Um, whatever, uh, it, by the early 18th century, the Haudenosaunee are no longer living um, in uh, Ontario until later in 1789 when Brandt brings people to the Haldeman Track and to Tanda maybe. But Podash's account is. Um, he notes that the history didn't come from his reading of others, but from the mouth of his father who died in 1893. And all of that history came from the mouth of his grandfather who died in 1869 at the age of, one of, of 104, which you know places him in the mid 1760s, 1770s, who would have been kind of witness, uh, not witness, but the next generation following these events that we're talking about. So this oral history is direct links so that um, uh, a very, I think, reliable source. Warren, well, we all know that uh, history of uh, the Anishinaabe, or the Ojibwe people. Uh, we have Copway's uh, traditional histories. Um, we have Peter Jones, uh, very important to the Mississauga, the credit, and now Mississauga, uh, we saw the new credit, now we saw the credit in Asikanak, um, who wrote a very important account. And these oral histories all tell the same story of moving down from the North Shore of Lake uh, Huron and into Southern Ontario at the end of this, uh, the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the year of the, eight, of the 1700s. Um, also, uh, the account being told in Osborne and Whitmeister's account in 1997. Um, so when we look at this, we see Mississauga along the Lake Ontario shore in 1763. Um, the British Crown reaches agreements with the Mississauga for, um, starts reaching agreements with the Mississauga and starts signing treaties with the Mississauga for that area. Um, current understanding of Anishinaabeg occupations along the North Shore uh, between four and six very small communities, maybe 100 people each, uh, focused on the major drainages running on Lake Ontario between the Grand and what is now Prince Edward uh, County. Um, there is a brand new article in the last Ontario Archaeology by Gary Warwick uh, called Living Lightly on the Land, and he's talking about early 19th century Mississauga at Davisville. Um, just a great article. Um, it's difficult to archaeologically detect sites that might have been occupied uh, in the early 1700s, but Gary makes a point um, of how how one goes about, what, what are the signals that we might find of settlements of that period. And so in the chapter, he reviews some of the material that he goes on to write a, a very lengthy article about. And you can see here, um, that you have Indian farms and Indian settlement shown in this this bend of of the Grand, which is and and he looked at the Methodist mission members, 
And so he puts that together and looks at uh, the distribution of those sites. And, and when he did his excavations, uh, he has thoughts about the importance, for example, of highly fragmented burned and calcined bone, uh, maybe from bone grease production. And he believes this is a real signature of Mississauga occupation. Uh, Dana had found the same thing in Ganesta Wagon. So it led to a spirited discussion about whether the material that Dana had found in Ganesta Wagon was Mississauga. Was that an evidence of Mississauga? Or was that a thing that the Seneca on the site were also doing uh, earlier? Um, at Davisville 3, there were a few more uh, European objects that you uh, can see here, um, which are objects that Gary argues are important signature markers for sites of that period, um, early 19th century. And we might expect to see not this material, but certainly the shell and maybe some brass and iron on the sites of the early 1700s. Um, it's summed up the volume by Rick Hill. Um, the stunning kind of piece he wrote was um, talking about how these objects resurface to tell us about their history and about the history of the people that occupied uh, these areas. Um, I had heard that from other Haudenosaunee elders, um, and it Rick made the point that the intention and science of archaeology combined to give us um, the artistic intention of the makers of these objects and the science of archaeology combined to give us a chance to reflect on meaning, and for that he's thankful. Um, and for that, obviously, all of us are thankful. I want to point out that uh, we dedicate this volume to two very important Haudenosaunee women, uh, many of us who, who have worked um, in Southern Ontario, Nobar Paris, who was uh, a counselor for District 6 between 2001 and 2010, was the burial counselor, worked with elders and traditionalists, um, insisting, I watched her insist with many uh, developers that these on uh, that these people would be left where they were found and if it was absolutely impossible and she would consult with Haudenosaunee chiefs and faith keepers and and move them but with huge dignity and reverence um she was a mentor to joanne thomas who was equally dedicated as a land use officer and later supervisor for the lands and resources office um, and i know many archaeologists who who miss her um, and she was, by the way, central in the very earliest years thinking about a heritage conservation district and getting Six Nations Council support for establishing that district for Taiga and uh, for that additional layer of protection for the site. Um, 